Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Simon Murray, and it's my privilege to be headmaster of St Peter's College and to welcome you all here this evening. We would like to acknowledge this land that we meet on today is the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the greater Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still important to the living Ghana people today. Welcome, welcome to you all to St Peter's College Adelaide. This evening we have the second public lecture delivered by Professor Seligman, Adelaide's thinker in residence. James Harvey, Chair of the St Peter's College Council and Governors, Mrs Mandy Seligman, Jenny and Carly, the Honourable Grace Portalesi, MP Minister of Education and representing the Premier of South Australia this evening and indeed the member, member for Hartley, the Honourable Lisa Vlahos, MP Parliamentary Secretary to the Premier and member for Taylor, Keith Bartley, CEO of the Department of, for Education and Child Development, Warren Simons, Principal of Mount Barker High School and his faculty, Gabriel Kelly, Director, Adelaide Thinkers in Residence and her staff, partners in the Seligman Residency and their representatives, Professor Field Rickards, Dean of the Graduate School of Education, University of Melbourne, Professor John Hattie, Director of the Melbourne Education Research Institute and Associate Dean Research at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education, Associate Professor Lee Waters, Director in the Masters of School Leadership at the Melbourne Graduate School of Education and advisor to St Peter's College on wellbeing. Mrs Amy Walker from the University of Pennsylvania, distinguished guests, parents of St Peter's College, students, staff, ladies and gentlemen. The Thinkers in Residence program is a partnership between many organisations. And St Peter's College is proud to be a lead partner with the South Australian Government and the Department for Education and Child Development and the impact this residence will have on our youth. Professor Martin Seligman is Adelaide's thinker in residence for 2012 and we're blessed also for 2013, and in this capacity is a strategic advisor on wellbeing at St Peter's College. Professor Seligman's work on learned helplessness, on depression, on optimism and pessimism, and on positive psychology. He's worked across all these areas. He is currently Zellerbach Family Professor of Psychology in the Department of Psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as Director of the Positive Psychology Centre. A prolific author, he has written 20 books and 200 articles on motivation and personality. His books have been translated into 20 languages and have been bestsellers both in America and abroad. His work has been featured on the front page of the New York Times, Time, Newsweek, US News, World Report and US Today. Among his better known works are Learned Optimism, What You Can Change and What You Can't, The Optimistic Child and his most recent books a Flourish, published just last year, and the best-selling Authentic Happiness, which was published in 2002. Professor Seligman is the recipient of two distinguished scientific 
contribution awards from the American Psychological Association. The Laurel Award of the American Association for Applied Psychology and Prevention and the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Society for Research in Psychopathology. Professor Seligman received both the American Psychological Society's William James Fellows Award for contribution to basic science and the James McKean Cattell Fellow Award for the application of psychological knowledge. For 14 years, he was the director of the clinical training program of the psychology department of the University of Pennsylvania. He's a past president of the Division of Clinical Psychology of the American Psychological Association. And in 1996, Professor Seligman was elected president of the American Psychological Association by the largest vote in modern history. His primary aim as APA president was to join practice and science together so both might flourish, a goal that has dominated his whole life as a psychologist. Since 2000, his main mission has been the promotion of the field of positive, positive psychology. This discipline includes the study of positive emotions, positive character traits, and positive institutions. In recognition of his contribution to science, for a career spent charging creatively ahead of his field and then pulling his colleagues along, and as a distinguished member of Saints, Professor Seligman was awarded the rare honour of honorary life membership of the St Peter's Old Collegian Association. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I now invite Professor Seligman to, to deliver his second public lecture as part of the Adelaide Thinkers in Residence program. Please welcome Professor Seligman. Well, I'm grateful to your uh, premier, Jay Wetherill, for inviting me here. I'm discovering that he and I share a common passion on the immunization of children. Uh, to Gabe Kelly, the director of Thinker in Residence, to Simon Murray for his hospitality, and especially to Matthew White, who I think has been the catalyst for all this. Uh, so thank you. It being a school, I'm going to start with a quiz. So uh, you have paper, take out a pencil. All right, so two, two item quiz. And the, 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 the first question, uh, in two words or fewer, what do you most want for your children? Now, I, I suspect having asked this before, uh, how many of you wrote down happiness? Yeah, happiness, uh, fulfillment, health, uh, civilization, love, the, probably what you wrote down, okay? That's question one. And question two is in two words or fewer, what do schools teach? Well, what you, what you would have written down would be something like literacy, numeracy, discipline, uh, knowledge, uh, work skills. So tonight, I want you to imagine the notion of positive education, which suggests that we can both do traditional education, the latter, numeracy, literacy, knowledge, theory, and we can teach our children well-being, happiness, health, fulfillment. 
and that when these two things are taught at the same time and embedded in each other, they're synergistic, not antagonistic. So that's the main theme of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Here's the outline of what, what we're going to do. This is I, the first thing. Um, the the um, question is, if we're going to do positive education, what is it we want to build? Happiness is too vague. Uh, and I'm going to suggest to you that the acronym PERMA tells us the five components of what positive psychology should, suggests we should be building. P is positive emotion, E is engagement, R is relationships, M is meaning, and A is accomplishment. And I'll re return you uh, to that in, in a couple of minutes. And then we'll ask the question, is building PERMA possible? Or is it just boosterism? That is, when you teach people to have more positive emotion, more better relations, do they then just revert to where they were, as in dieting, as in psychotherapy, uh, where I spent a lot of my life? So I'm going to talk about how to build it. Uh, and I'll take you through uh, each of the five elements very quickly, essentially to do one thing, uh, to tell you the science that's developed over the last 15 years. I'll try to tell you for each of P, E, R, M, and A, something that I didn't know and you didn't know before. And also in the process of doing that, what we know about reliably increasing these. And <clears throat> I'll do that for positive emotion, for engagement, for relationships, for meaning, and for accomplishment. And then for the second half of, of my lecture, uh, I want to turn to the question of schools and larger units. The first half is about building well-being in individuals. And the question is, can this be done in larger units? And can it be done through schools and through parents? I'll tell you what's been going on in schools. And in doing so, I, I want to raise the question of what we're really trying to teach. And I don't think it's spelling and geometry. I think it's something else. And I'll try to say what that is. And in, in doing that, I want to talk about the notion of character in teaching, since this is, I think, right at, right at the base of what we're trying to teach. I'm going to say a little bit about uh, what we know about the character of great teachers been studied, and uh, a little bit about what teaching character would consist in. There's something very new going on in the teaching of character. Uh, has to do with the right-hand side of the report card. Can we actually build and measure young people's character? Um, I'll then talk about uh, this being done in the largest scale I know, 1.1 million people, uh, men and women of the United States Army, it's decided officially to adopt positive education, resilience, and positive psychology. And then uh, I want to return <coughs> to the vision that I believe uh, your Premier and I share, and the question of uh, what might this mean for a visionary South Australia. And I'll, I'll make a couple of concrete proposals in line with this. And finally, I want to talk politics with you, uh, the politics of well-being. There actually is a politics of well-being. It's not left or right politics. It's not the question of who should do it, the government or individuals. It's what it is. And I'm going to suggest to you that the end of good government is the well-being of its citizens. So that's what we'll do tonight. Uh, so let me start with the question of what, what does it mean to flourish? What, what is well-being? And um, uh, uh, I come from uh, the discipline of psychology. When I was a clinical psycho when I was a psychologist as usual, when I was on an airplane and uh, I'd introduce myself to my seatmate, uh, they'd move away from me. <laughs> and now, when I introduce myself to my seatmates, they move toward me. If somehow psychology had the idea that if it was all about pathology and what was wrong with you, that that was the royal road to building what was best in human beings. And I'm going to suggest it's not the royal road, it's just one of two roads. And the other road is finding out what's best in the people that you know, can be measured, and building it, enhancing it, living around it. Uh, and. Uh, so the question I've wrestled with for 15 years now is what are the elements of well-being? And by well-being, I mean 
uh, what free people choose to do, what's north of indifference for human beings. So psychology has been about the relief of misery and the relief of suffering. That's going from minus eight to minus two. But I believe that we try in our lives and with our children to go from plus three to plus six. So tonight is about plus three to plus six. I'm not for a moment suggesting we should abandon our effort to reduce misery. We're proud of that. Uh, misery gets in the way, but it does not obviate well-being, very interestingly. Uh, so what tonight is about is what, would, what do we know about plus two to plus six in life? And I suggest that there are five elements of that. The first is positive emotion. It's uh, the smiley face, uh, hedonics, the hedonic view. And uh, 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 I'm not going to talk much about that, but I do want to emphasize that positive psychology is by and large not about being bright-eyed and bushy-tailed bushy and merry. In fact, this first dimension, positive emotion, is normally distributed in the population. And that means there are three billion people in the world today who don't feel good. And in fact, it's not very changeable. As best we can tell, you've got to with uh, uh, those of us, I'm one of them, who live in the bottom half of positive emotion, what we have is ways of getting you to live in the upper range of your set range for positive emotion. Um, and it's the fact that positive emotion is highly heritable and not very changeable that leads to the second element, which is engagement. The um, being completely absorbed with someone you love in your work or in your leisure, being one with the music. The third element is good relationships with other people. And it turns out this stuff has been discovered about that, and I'll talk a little bit about one or two of the discoveries. Uh, the fourth element is belonging to and serving something that you think is larger than you are. The self the selfish gene view of biology is a completely impoverished soil for meaning. Meaning is about uh, being part of something larger and serving it. And I'll tell you a little bit about the importance of meaning and a little bit about the science. And finally, accomplishment. We strive for mastery, for competence, for achievement. Uh, so those are the the five elements that I'm going to talk about tonight. I'll talk a bit about, a little bit about what we know about each one of those. Now importantly, each of these elements turns out to be measurable. And part of my job uh, in positive psychology has been to give this stuff away. So I have a website called AuthenticHappinessOneWord.org. It's free. About two and a half million people have registered at it, have taken the test. It has the 20 leading tests of these five uh, elements on it. Uh, and uh, so if you're interested, for example, of where, where your sense of humor fits relative to uh, other Australian women, there are actually norms there about that. And uh, you're welcome to use these for yourself, for your children, for your school, for your corporation. And then, uh, equally important, uh, when I think about psychotherapy and dieting, these things are measurable, but it turns out that uh, it's an uphill battle to teach them. And when we teach them, they tend to regress back to zero. Well, it turns out that each of the PERMA dimensions is buildable. And you can actually have in your life, your children can have in their lives, more positive emotion than you have now, more engagement at school, at work than you have, better relations than you have, more meaning in life, and more achievement and mastery. Um, so that's what we're going to turn to now. And as a psychologist, I come from work on individuals. Uh, and so what I'm going to do for about seven or eight minutes uh, is to take you through each of these five elements and tell you one discovery that's occurred uh, in the last 15 years and a little bit about what's been discovered about how to build them. So I'll start with positive emotion. So um, there's something called 
the Losada ratio, which uh, is a very interesting discovery. This comes out of Barbara Fredrickson and Marcel Losada. They go to uh, American corporations, 60 of them, 20 are flourishing economically, 20 are uh, stagnating, and 20 are going under, going bankrupt. And they me measure, they record every word that's said, and they ask, what is the ratio of positive to negative words that occurs, and how does it relate to the economic flourishing? And it turns out there is such a ratio, and uh, corporations in which the ratio of positive statement, positive words, single words, to negative words is 2.9 to 1 or greater are statistically flourishing economically. Between 1 and 2.9, they're stagnating, and below 1, in which the negative words outweigh the positive words, they are uh, going under. Uh, now, that's just a correlation, and the 2.9 to 1 is not something you want to bring home to your marriage. Now, today is Valentine's Day, and so I have one Valentine's Day hint for you. Don't do 2.9 to 1. Uh, so for every bad thing you say to your spouse, if you only say 2.9 good things, you're headed for divorce. Uh, and this is actually known in a quite a interesting study. Uh, my uh, uh, colleagues John and Julie Gottman lock, lock couples into an apartment for the weekend and, and up till midnight they record every word that's said and they compute the Losada ratio and then they attempt to predict divorce. And indeed if your ratio is lower than 5 to 1, uh, it's a predictor of divorce, statistical predictor of divorce. Now. Um, my, some of you may know who my daughter Nikki is, not, neither of the two younger ones. Uh, when Nikki was five, she founded Positive Psychology. I had been elected president of APA, and uh, I shouted at Nikki when she was in the garden after her fifth birthday, and she said I was a grouch and I needed to change, and she was able to change her whining, and if she could get rid of whining, I could get rid of being such a curmudgeon. Uh, and that founded positive psychology. And uh, she did something like this again about three years ago. She's now uh, 20, uh, but when she was 17 and in high school, majoring in entitlement, she, um, uh, <laughs> I came home one night excitedly to tell Mandy and Nikki and the other kids about the Losada ratio. And uh, then I went off to work for the, it was a Thursday night, and at 11 Thursday night, uh, Nikki came up to me at the computer and wanted me to drive her to a party. And I shouted at her and said, Nikki, Thursday night, get to work, go to sleep, I'm working. And she looked at me and said, Daddy, you have a terrible Losada ratio. <laughs> uh, which is to say that uh, when, what is the right ratio for raising children? And what's really going on with the Losada ratio is this issue of we have to criticize people, but how many positive things do we have to say as a background so that they hear us rather than treat us as the enemy? Uh, and uh, so that's a, a little bit of what uh, goes on in the science here. Uh, engagement, and this will lead to the discussion of character a bit. So uh, the question of when do people go into flow? When are you one with the music? And it turns out that Mike Cheek sent me high has been the pioneer of this, that um, when we're using our highest strengths to just match the challenges that come our way, that's when we go into flow. And uh, this implies that you can actually have more of it. So indeed, one of the large endeavors that uh, Chris Peterson and I were involved in was to write uh, the opposite of DSM and ICD, not the diagnostic manuals of being crazy and insane, but the diagnostic manual of being sane. And so um, a book, uh, that large tome that we wrote is called The Classification of Strengths and Virtues, and part of this is the measurement of human strengths. We believe there are 24 universal human strengths. By the way, they're different from talents. Talents are means to an end. So IQ and perfect pitch we value not in their own right, but because they lead to things like, intelli we think, intelligent decisions and playing the violin. But strengths 
our moral strengths, things we value in their own right. We value kindness and fairness in their own right, not as means to an end. So um, what's been discovered about strengths? These are reliably tested for in children and adults. When people use them more, they go into flow more. And um, we give a, 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 well, let me, let me tell you a little bit about my scientific background. I'm a naughty thumb of science person. Uh, I, I've spent a lot of my life testing psychotherapies and drugs. And the way we ask, do these things really work, is we do random assignment placebo-controlled studies of a drug or a psychotherapy against the equivalent of an inert sugar pill. And we ask, uh, does it show something over and above this? And so when I started to work on the positive side of life, uh, we found that, there, that from the Buddha to pop psychology, there have been about 200 suggestions about what makes people lastingly happier. And so we decided we'd test that using random assignment placebo controlled testing. So what we do is we take um, as, as best we can each of these suggestions, we put them on websites with random assignment placebo controlled testing, uh, people do them and then we follow them for six months asking what does it do to depression, what's it do to anxiety, what's it do to life satisfaction. So one of the things we've tested is the question of signature strengths. So I'm going to do this with you now. Uh, I can only do half of So close your eyes. Close your eyes up there. Uh, think of something that you have to do every week at work that you don't like doing. OK, open your eyes. Um, so if we were doing an overnight workshop here, I would have you take the signature strengths test at AuthenticHappiness.org. You might find that your highest strength was humor and playfulness or kindness or social intelligence. Then your job is to do that task using your highest strength. And uh, so for example, uh, and, and what we find is when people do that, six months later compared to placebo controls, they're less depressed and their life satisfaction is higher and it becomes addicting. Now, let me just say a little bit, let me put some flesh on the skeleton. So, uh, one of my students was a waitress, and she hated waitressing. Heavy trays, she was working her way through graduate school, being patronized by customers, so she took the signature strengths test, and her highest strength was social intelligence. So her task was to recraft waitressing using her highest strength. So she decided she would make the encounter with her the social highlight of every customer's evening. Now notice, one, impossible to succeed at, but two, it puts what she's best at in the world on offer continually. And waitressing becomes fun. Tips become larger. Trays become less heavy. So that's a little bit of the E. Uh, relationships. Um, any, anyone in the audience a marriage counselor? Mar anyone do marriage counseling? Okay, well then I can speak with impunity. <laughs> marriage counseling is the worst, most difficult form of therapy. Uh, people are lying to each other, they're lying to you, um, and it's, um, it's statistics on outcome are really very poor. And if, if I t I've taught marriage counseling and sex therapy, and when I teach it, uh, what the marriage manuals are about is how to fight better. And again, oh, my second Valentine's Day. Oh, this is a big Valentine's Day suggestion. Um, what you're trying to do in marital therapy is to take insufferable marriages and make them barely tolerable. Uh, <laughs> And that's not a positive psychology approach. So a very interesting group of positive marital therapists about eight years ago, led by Shelley Gable, said, not, let's not look at how people fight, let's look at how they celebrate together. So what they did was to, uh, the question is, when your spouse comes home 
with a good event, a victory, what do you say? And it turns out you can divide what you say into a two by two. So, uh, and I'm going to talk about drill sergeants in about 20 minutes. This is what uh, drill sergeants, when they come home, tend to do active destructive. So they say things like, you know what tax bracket your promotion's going to put us into? <laughs> um, what I used to do until I read this literature, and what most of you do, is passive constructive, which is, congratulations, dear, you deserve it. That has no effect. You might as well not say anything at all. Has no effect. Uh, passive destructive is, what, what's for dinner? And, and the one that matters, and the one that doesn't come naturally, and my Valentine's Day suggestion is active constructive, which go, and we teach it, it goes something like this. Uh, it's not a shortcut, it's a long cut around celebration. Uh, dear, I've been reading your reports to the company, and uh, the last one you wrote on the pension plan, you know, for me was the single best fiscal report I've seen in all my years in business. Uh, now, exactly where were you when your boss told you you had been promoted? And she tells you. What you're trying to do is get her to relive the event and put her <clears throat> in touch with her highest strengths. Now, exactly what did your boss say? And she tells you, what, uh, what do you think the real reasons that you've been promoted are? And how can you use those more in our marriage or with the kids or at church? And it turns out when you teach people to do this, uh, love and commitment, divorce goes down, but love and commitment increase. And it's not just a technique for marriage, technique for friendship. How do you deal with good events. And by the way, I should say, strangely enough, uh, in my 35 years of teaching clinical psychology, I always taught my students about how to deal with awful events. So when people tell you terrible things, how to listen, how to ask the right questions. And strangely enough, we had no training in asking people what was best in their lives and asking the right questions. So this is, a, this is the question of, uh, you have a life, use it more. How do, how do we get people to do that? Uh, so that's a, a sample of what goes on in the relationship end of positive psychology, meaning uh, belonging to and serving something bigger than you are. Uh, I assign my students to uh, do something fun next week, hang out with their friends, go to the movies, and do something philanthropic, and write up what happens. And it turns out something very different happens. You, you may all know this, but your kids don't, uh, because they're leading their life around fun and pleasure. And it turns out when people report hanging out with their friends or going to a movie, when it's over, it's over. It has a square wave offset. But when people, were, one of my students uh, reported that her third grade nephew called her on the phone and needed to be tutored in fractions. And she spent uh, two hours on the phone tutoring him in fractions. And she said, after that, the whole day went better for me. Uh, people could, people liked me more. I could listen to other people. Uh, I was mellow. Um, and it turns out uh, altruistic action, we, uh, there's this huge controversy in biology, of which I'm a teeny part, on uh, altruism and group selection. And I believe that human beings are deeply altruistic, have been selected for it in group selection, that human beings are both selfish creatures and hive creatures. And the underestimated part of humanity is that we're very much like the social insects. Uh, and that's part of why uh, Homo sapiens is so uh, biologically successful. Um, our, our hedonic system is what, if about 10% of you on average would be depressed right now. And one suggestion, the most reliable mood lifter I know, temporary for depression, is to go out and help another person. I'm not preaching here. It turns out empirically, that's what works. We're why our hedonic system is wired to the service of others, importantly. 
and when, when my student reported uh, her fraction story, one of my business students said, um, I'm a business student because I want to make a lot of money. Money brings control, it brings security, and it brings happiness. But I was astonished to find out that I was happier helping another person than I was shopping. And that's a major insight for my young people. So that's a sample of what goes on in meaning. Um, accomplishment. One thing new under the sun is the measurement of grit and self-discipline. It's the question of who never gives up. And in school, we spend a great deal of our time uh, trying to get people to do better in school. And uh, Angela Duckworth, who's the leading person in this field, measures IQ and self-discipline. And she then goes on to predict how you're, what's going to happen to your grades, are you going to get into a good university. And it turns out, in general, across the board, Angela finds that self-discipline is roughly twice as important as IQ in uh, academic success. It predicts grades, it predicts uh, who's going to stay with it at places like the United States Military Academy, it predicts who's going to win this bizarre uh, spelling bee. That uh, self-discipline, um, and I guess one challenge to tell you about all of the other parts of PERMA, P-E-R and M, have reliable techniques taught in schools and with adults that increase them. No one has found a reliable way to increase self-discipline in kids. That's a discovery that, uh, if it can be done, one awaits. Okay, so that's the first half of my talk. And now I want to raise the question of larger units than the individual. And I want to talk about schools. So um, a lot of our work is in school. Um, we developed uh, something called Penn Resilience Training in which we teach kids optimism, positive emotion, and some of the other skills. And this has been replicated um, at least 21 times in controlled studies across the world involving several thousand children. These are controlled experiments. They are done in very poor kids. We do them in, in Harlem, in North Philadelphia, in South Tyneside, the poorest local authority in England, and in very wealthy schools like the one you're in today. And I'm going to talk about uh, the one you're in today and the remarkable journey it started on. Uh, uh, importantly, uh, resilience and optimism and PERMA classes are led by teachers. So we first started to do this with uh, just my graduate students, but I only have a few dozen graduate students, and that couldn't be disseminable. And when we started to find out that it worked, we asked, could we teach teachers to do this? So we developed a 10-day program in which you teach teachers the PERMA skills, first to lead in their own lives, and then in the second half, the last five days, how to teach these to children. And we tested teachers versus my graduate students, and teachers do at least as well as my graduate students, as measured by the outcomes in the students. Uh, and uh, the general outcome in these 21 replications is that when your teacher has learned these skills, then for the next year or two, if you measure depression, anxiety, and conduct and well-being in the kids, statistically, as these kids go through puberty, uh, they're less depressed, less anxious, better conduct, higher well-being than the controls who didn't go through it. And children learn here to handle stressors, they learn a realistic form of optimism, decision-making, and the result is reliably less depression and anxiety through puberty. Uh, and higher well-being. Now, this brings up the question of what are we trying to teach in school? What do we really want our kids to learn? And uh, I've come to believe that what the content of what we teach, spelling, geometry, fractions, is a medium for something else. And that we're, what we're really after, this is David uh, Levin's view of teaching, the head of the KIPP schools, 110 charter schools that we work with of uh, very poor black kids uh, age 5 through age 12, that what we're really trying to teach is first social navigation, that is how to get an adult to like you, 
how to get peers to like you. Secondly, I know it's an old word, but it's very real, and that's rhetoric. How to tell a good story, how to write a good story, how to make a compelling argument, how to ask the right questions, how to listen. And finally, and most importantly, I believe we're trying to teach character. We're trying to teach good character in the sense that I referred to before. And that's what the VIA Signature Strengths Test is about. And um, uh, let me say a little bit about great teachers and about the right-hand side of the report card. I guess uh, I'll start with uh, uh, the measurement of character in uh, kids. So uh, the KIPP schools and their partner, the equivalent of uh, St. Peter's College in Adelaide, the Riverdale School in New York, have together developed the right-hand side of the report card. So in the right-hand side of the report card, uh, what my uh, colleague said, well, what are the strengths, the character traits we really value in children? Uh, uh, zest, grit, um, uh, and the like, and there are eight of them, and they're operationalized. So for zest, the, the teacher's grade on a one to five scale uh, actively participates, uh, shows enthusiasm, and invigorates others. And so you actually get grades in this, and then these become targets for parent-teacher meetings and meetings with the kids. And um, so this is what's going on in character education. It's measurable, and I guess I have to say something about measurement per se, that there's a, an old saw in industrial psychology in which the boss says, I want on my desk every day a number for X, whatever. And when you start measuring it, X increases. People do it. They find ways by deshrouding character, by deshrouding positive emotion. People invent ways to increase it. Uh, and what the character right-hand side of the report card does, it, le it leads to very fruitful conversations with kids and with parents. So I commend this new work to you. And I also wanted to mention the question of uh, teachers and what, 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 which of the 24 characters' strengths do teachers have? Now, this is a funny-looking graph, but, uh, and my laser pointer doesn't seem to be working, but I think I can describe it. Uh, those are, in black are the 24 character strengths. And if they're close together, so look at, you see gratitude and love. People who have gratitude tend to have love, but people who have gratitude tend not to be open-minded. So the further, and this is based on something like 100,000 people, so the closer together things are, the more likely they co-occur in human beings. The farther they are apart, the more likely if you have one, you don't have the other. Is it clear? So far, that's the mathematical, the breakdown of what the mathematics means. Uh, and we divide these into heart versus mind strengths and self and other strengths. So the question is, what do people in different professions have? Well, it turns out teachers, uh, how many of you are teachers? Okay. What teachers tend to have is uh, kindness, forgiveness, gratitude, and love. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum are professors. But professors don't have those things. <laughs> They've got things like creativity and love of learning and perspective. And then there's the question of, of CEOs and entrepreneurs. And they have zest and hope and curiosity. And they're at the other end of the uh, spectrum from administrators. Administrators are modest and fair and prudent and honest. That's a description of uh, professions. But then we ask the question, what do the great teachers have? as opposed to just teaching in general. And it turns out that the great teachers, there are two strengths they have in abundance, humor and zest. And when you think about teacher education, as I do quite a lot, the question is, what should we teach teachers? Well, zest and humor are teachable, actually. 
Uh, I think they're just as teachable as how to teach geometry. And so I think it uh, behooves us to ask the question of what the great ones have and can we teach it. So what's going on? In, uh, uh, school stuff is going on uh, in the United States, in the UK, and in Australia. So in three of the local authorities of the UK, uh, teachers are learning the PERMA skills and teaching them. And it ranges from wealthy ones, Hertfordshire, to the poorest local authority, South Tyneside. Uh, the KIPP schools in the United States, I just showed you some of what they're up to. Riverdale, which is a St. Peter's College of, of New York City. Uh, uh, Geelong Grammar School, four years ago, undertook this. Uh, Stephen Meek uh, and the, the school council uh, decided it would teach positive psychology to the 200 faculty and they would teach it to the kids. And uh, uh, I'm told on Helen, it started out I think as a campaign to build a gym, a new gym. And Helen Hanbury, who was one of the major donors, I'm told on her deathbed said, not a gym, I want well-being for adolescents. And that's how I got to know Geelong Grammar School. Uh, and uh, 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 so uh, four years ago, uh, uh, 100 of the teachers gave up two weeks of their summer vacation. 20 of my faculty came, and essentially we put them through the teaching course. And now the 200 faculty at Geelong Grammar have been incorporating this reception through year 12 through Geelong Grammar. Uh, I'll be off to Mount Barker High School tomorrow to ask, can this be done? And this is really modeled on what St. Peter's College here in Adelaide is doing. So St. Peter's College has decided in its strategic plan that it is about well-being and it wants to teach well-being and have well-being pervade what happens at the school. Uh, I, I think I can show a little more about what it's up to. It's just begun this uh, huge endeavor and it's begun, and I'll, when I talk about South Australia generally, I'll return to this, it's begun with measurement. So it is taking the entire student body and importantly, the entire staff, not just the teachers, but the, the, the kitchen workers and the gardeners as well. And it's measuring now, before any intervention, positive emotion, engagement, good relationships, meaning, and accomplishment, which together are what I mean by flourishing. And then it's going to undertake something very important. Uh, 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 in July, the University of Pennsylvania's faculty, and then many of the Australian trainers who have been trained uh, uh, in doing this uh, will uh, have 10 days with the uh, St. Peter's College faculty and teach PERMA. And then we will ask the question over the next few years, do these five elements increase? Uh, and that I think is the uh, St. Peter's College uh, uh, endeavor. Uh, 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 in measurement, uh, the measurement's been done on the upper school, and these are the, the 20 or so tests of PERMA that have been done. So we know something about the mean well-being of the entire upper school at the moment, and we'll be watching this snapshot across time. Uh, how many of you are parents of... Uh, good. So uh, you are probably asking... Uh, St. Peter's Adelaide is making a big investment on the, in this. And the question is, well, what's in it for my boy? What are the outcomes that are likely to occur? And here's uh, what I think they are. Um, from the science, I think I can say with certainty that your boy will emerge from this with more PERMA. Um, it is likely that he will emerge from this with skills that result in less depression. Uh, over the course of uh, the second decade of his life. Uh, it is likely that he will emerge with skills that fight anxiety and produce less anxiety over the second decade of his life. Uh, it is possible from the scientific data that his conduct will be better than it would have been otherwise. Uh, it is possible that his achievement will be higher. I haven't been able to talk about the synergy between 
positive emotion and achievement in school, but it turns out they're synergistic. And if you just want the intuition about that, think about a baby. If you scare a baby or abandon her, make her sad or angry, uh, she pulls in on herself and, and falls back on what she already knows. It's when a baby is secure and happy that she explores the world and learns. This translates into a literature in which if you put people in a negative mood, they're better at rote learning, but worse at creativity, innovation, most of what we're trying to teach in school. But when you put people in a good mood, uh, the non-rote learning occurs better. So uh, there is possible that kids will do better. I haven't been able to talk about uh, success in life, but emblematic uh, in that is a study that Ed Diener and I did a while back in which we took the upper 10% of University of Illinois uh, undergraduates, the upper 10% on uh, well-being. We con controlled for how much their parents earned and their grades. We looked 15 years later and at, at age uh, 35, the upper 10% on well-being was earning $15,000 a year more on average than the other 90% holding constant income and the like. Uh, and what I'm not going to be able to talk about at all tonight and what uh, I, we work on vigorously with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and I think our fourth event on February 27th will be about uh, positive physical and mental health, but it is entirely possible that long-range physical health will improve. So that, I think, is the rationale for St. Peter Co Peter's College's investment and the, the possible outcomes. Now, I want to spend my final 10 minutes talking about huge organizations. The Chief of Staff of the United States Army decided three years ago, given suicide, post-traumatic stress disorder, panic, divorce, substance abuse, that he would institute uh, positive psychology, resilience training, and measure it throughout the entire United States Army. And uh, uh, he met with me and uh, seconded the University of Pennsylvania to do this. And um, it can they've allocated about $140 million to it. Uh, and uh, there are th three components of comprehensive soldier fitness. The first is uh, the chief of staff decided he wanted to create an army that was just as psychologically fit as physically fit. So we had to ask the measure psychological fitness in the entire army. So an instrument called the GAT was created that all 1.1 million soldiers have taken. Uh, it's proving to be highly predictive. This is just a great, uh, uh, there are 1,200 full colonels in the army and every year only 33 are promoted to brigadier general. So we asked the question, could we predict from the GAT uh, who's going to get promoted to general? And the answer is very strongly, you can predict it. Uh, and I mentioned to the upper school today another Valentine's Day hint. Uh, the, the single best predictor of leadership ratings that we have in the military is, is the capacity to love and be loved. So another Valentine's Day hint. Uh, then. Uh, General Casey said, uh, uh, we've read your stuff on schools, and uh, that's the Army model. We've got 40,000 teachers in the Army, the drill sergeants. So your job, Dr. Seligman, will be to train all the drill, drill sergeants in the Army in PERMA and resilience, uh, and they will train the entire Army. So indeed, that is well underway. We have now trained 7,000 drill sergeants. Every month, 180 of them come to the Univers University of Pennsylvania, and we spend 10 days doing what we'll be doing at St. Peter's College, what we did at Geelong Grammar. And now we're getting findings on what happens. So we're able to ask the question in the entire army, if you have, if your drill sergeant has had training in this, and then your deployed, what happens to the psychological characteristics? And basically we're finding that uh, when you're deployed, if you've had perma and resilience training, your catastrophic thinking goes down, uh, 
If you're deployed and you haven't had it, you become more catastrophic. Same thing with adaptability. And in June, I, I'm not at liberty to talk about it, in June, the Army will re release the findings on suicide and post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's what's happening in the Army. Uh, it's far and away the largest test of positive psychology that's ever been carried out, but it is the educational model. Uh, and this brings me finally to uh, South Australia. I've only been here, it's my third trip, but I've only been here for two weeks. So uh, this is what Gabe has got me doing to think about what might happen. And when I look at your Premier's vision and mine, uh, they're very, very close in uh, what I'm after. So one of my mentors was Jonas Salk, the person who uh, uh, created the Salk vaccine. And toward the end of his life, I had a conversation with Jonas, and I asked him what he would be doing now if he were a young man again. And he said, I'd be doing immunization again, but I'd be doing it psychologically rather than physically. And so here is my vision of what might happen in South Australia in the next couple of years. The first thing is to measure the well-being of every single child in South Australia, uh, the PERMA of every single child, and then to begin the programs with parents and schools that teach teachers and parents how to teach well-being. And the vision here is this will immunize children against depression, against anxiety, and promote uh, well-being. Uh, and uh, I'm looking at Field Ricard now, a visionary uh, dean of education from the University of, of Melbourne. And Field's question is, well, how can we spread this? I mean, there are good tests of this, but uh, the supply of good teachers of this out, outstrips the demand. So it's Field's vision that this will become part of teacher education a basic part of teacher education. And I think this also coheres with your Premier's vision. That is, can the great universities of South Australia begin in their teacher education programs to teach the PERMA skills to teacher? And uh, uh, this articulates with, uh, I think, the most successful educational program I've ever been involved in. So uh, for seven years now, uh, we've been giving something called MAP at the University of Pennsylvania. It's the Rolls Royce of learning about positive psychology. We select 35 out of about 200 adults, people like you, from around the world every year, and they come once a month to the University of Pennsylvania. Typically, they commute from all over the world for, one, for long weekends. I bring in the leading researchers and teachers in positive psychology, and uh, one gets from the University of Pennsylvania a master's degree. So part of the question for uh, Uni Melbourne, for uh, the great universities of South Australia, is there some way some hybrid form of on-site teaching and distance education we can uh, bring to your universities so that there can be widespread uh, dissemination of the teaching of positive psychology. Uh, and if this works in South Australia, if we can measure the well-being of every child, if we can begin programs for teachers and parents that build it, if we can build it in the university, then this is a prototype for uh, bringing well-being, more well-being, more flourishing to the planet. Uh, finally, the politics of this. Uh, as I mentioned, it is a political question, and uh, it's having political resonance, at least in the UK and France. So the prime ministers, uh, Mr. Cameron and Mr. Sarkozy, have uh, asked the question, what is wealth for? And economists often say, well, it's to produce more wealth. But uh, Cameron and Sarkozy and uh, positive psychology says, no, the purpose of wealth, wealth is in service of well-being. And so uh, the prime minister of England has uh, uh, embarked on a campaign to measure the well-being of all of the UK, and most importantly, to hold himself accountable for the success of public policy, not by changes in wealth, 
but by changes in well-being. Very bold thing for Cameron to do, given a time of massive draconian cutbacks. At any rate, we're involved in that. Um, and um, this brings me to, again, back to South Australia and uh, uh, Florence of the 1450s. So when, when nations are poor and at war and in civil turmoil, and in plague, it is perfectly natural that their primary concerns should be defense and damage. But when nations are wealthy and not in civil turmoil and not at war and not in famine, the question is what do they seek? And Florence of 1450 uh, is a beautiful example of this. They, they became very wealthy uh, due to largely Medici banking genius. And they asked what they should do with their wealth. And uh, uh, the generals wanted to conquer the peninsula, but uh, Cosimo the Elder won the day and decided that they decided that Florence would invest in beauty. And they gave us what was 200 years later called the Renaissance. Now, being in, I, I want to say I think the wealthy nations of the world, uh, Australia, uh, the United States, uh, the European Union, are at a Florentine moment. And the question is, what will we do with our treasure? And sitting in South Australia, when I think about Florence, Florence became the magnet for the great artists. That's where the action was happening. Well, wouldn't it be interesting, given uh, that South Australia is, I think, one of the states of highest well-being on the planet, if, if Adelaide, could become a Florentine magnet for people who are interested in building human well-being. So I think the, the rich world is at a Florentine moment, and I think South Australia may be at a particular one. And I close with the following. Uh, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche um, said, asked about the, the long sweep of human history. And he asked the question, um, what's it been about? And he says the first 4,000 years of human history, he called the camel. And the camel sits there and moans, takes it. And then Nietzsche talks about the lion or the rebel. And he says, the rebel says no. The rebel says no to poverty, no to discrimination, no to tyranny, no to disease. And um, I th actually think you have to been, be blinded by ideology not to see that the politics of no has worked. That by almost every statistic I know, uh, the world, including the poorest parts of the world, are better off than they were before the politics of no. But then Nietzsche asked the question, imagine that it worked. Imagine that politically, socially, in our professions, we could actually get rid of war and poverty and discrimination. What can we say yes to? That takes us to zero. What can we hope for? What is the most we can hope for for our children? It's commonly said that uh, the next generation of children will not be as rich as we are. But Nietzsche would tell us there's plenty of room for more well-being. Nietzsche talks about the politics of yes. He asks, what is it that every human being can affirm? And I think that's what we've talked about tonight, that what can we hope for in life? Not just the alleviation of misery and suffering, which I've devoted my life to and I'm all for. For our children, we can say yes to more positive emotion in life, more engagement, with the people we love in our work, more noble meaning and purpose in life, better relations, and more positive accomplishment. I think what every human being can say yes to is more flourishing. And indeed, it's a special privilege to be in South Australia at this time, since I think you may become the core of this. So thank you.
ladies and gentlemen, Professor Seligman and I are going to move down onto the uh, floor level. Uh, there is uh, a wonderful opportunity for questions. Uh, I know Martin Seligman is keen. This is the part, a significant part of the evening that uh, he looks forward to in engaging with you. Um, Martin will stand in this side of the microphone and we'd ask people to come forward to the microphone up the front there. Um, and uh, others who have questions, please be ready uh, to step forward. Uh, we've got time for a reasonable number. So as uh, we make our way uh, down to the floor, can I ask uh, which one of you might uh, be ready to come forward to ask that important question? Thank you. Um, firstly, a very warm welcome to Adelaide. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, uh, you mentioned that um, a lot of what you were talking about today was very much individually based. And so you were talking about development of PERMA in teachers and students and in parents. I'm just wondering, um, when you run the programs, to what extent do you also focus or need to focus on alignment of systems and processes that support that behaviour, you know, working from a systems perspective, if you like. Oh, that's mm. such an important question, and it, can you hear me now? So we, we started out with single classrooms, and that had good effects when we taught it. Then we went to whole schools, because the single classrooms were embedded in schools that weren't remotely interested in well-being. <laughs> then we did whole schools like Geelong Grammar, and indeed that's the St. Peter's College endeavor. And then we've asked the question about parents, so I spent uh, our Department of Education spent $2.7 million to develop a parent program in which we teach the teachers and the parents, and they both teach the children. And then we have the question of the state, of South Australia more generally. That is, what if this were part of the culture? Would even more be learned? So I don't know the answer to that, but, but indeed that is the, the very texture of what I've been up to for a decade. To what extent has that needed to be supported by a toolkit which is organisationally embedded? So, for example, the way in which teachers are rewarded and their performance is monitored in the same way that students are. Right. Um, well, we don't know the answer to that because the right side of the report card is only about a year old. So, again, uh, it is the hope of the KIPP schools that if you embed it generally in the community and the parents, that character education will take better. Hi, um, I helped found the South Australian chapter of a, a group called the Zeitgeist Movement and I guess a really short way of I, I think of the movement is it's about changing our, our Western definition of success. Uh, currently it seems to be if someone has made it and is successful then they've acquired financial, material, wealth, power, control and fame. Um, I'd like to see that change to things like, you know, how much have people contributed to humanity and, you know, how much to the environment and having an e economic system which values abundance and those sorts of things. Do you think that by changing our education system uh, that will actually have uh, similar effects? Um, I, I'm not sure that the educational system is the... Uh, fulcrum for this, and it is indeed why I've gotten involved in if, what you would call the politics of this. So um, here's, here's what's going, I'm on the Prime Minister's Statistical Commission and try to give advice about this. So here's the controversy in the UK about this. What is the bottom line? Is there uh, GDP on unemployment, is that the bottom line? And we've said no, that's only a little part of it. PERMA is the bottom line. So what we want for a nation is not just GDP and low unemployment, but high positive emotion, high engagement, better relationships and more meaning. The A is the, the GDP part. And so we believe that by measuring these things uh, in schools, in corporations, in a nation, we might have a new notion of prosperity. So prosperity, uh, for good reasons, if, if in, when we're very poor as human beings, then the notion of prosperity, uh, GDP is a rough approximation of it. But now, every time there's a suicide in Australia, the GDP goes up. 
Uh, it's the utilization of goods and services. Uh, every time there's an automobile accident, a GDP goes up. So the question is, what is the new prosperity? And so my argument is a lot like yours, that by measuring both wealth and PERMA, uh, we can strive to a, a, a new prosperity for, for humans. Excellent. Can I ask a second question? Or? Um, with the Occupy movement around the world, I'm assuming you know we are the 99% Occupy Wall Street and the like. Uh, so they seem to be at the re rebellious stage. How long do you think until they'll become the, uh, the child reborn stage and, and hopefully accept some of the PERMA and, and that sort of stuff? Well, I don't really have an opinion about that. So from, <laughs> from a distance, some of what Occupy is saying no but it's also been saying yes to some things. So um, I, I don't have a, an opinion. Thank you. Um, Professor Zelligman, we really appreciate your um, knowledge. Thank you. Um, I have a question about self-discipline as a trait for our young boys. I was interested to hear that you said that self-discipline was um, shown to be more important than IQ in predicting academic achievement, um, but that there wasn't yet a way to teach this. Um, I'm just wondering if you can elaborate on that at all. Just look at my small sample size of four boys. Um, <laughs> they obviously all have very different personality traits, and I can see that some of them just have such an innate desire to, to learn and to be challenged. Um, and so they find sitting to do work easy, and yet um, one of them particularly um, finds that very challenging. And yet um, when he does get the self-discipline to, to sit and work at something, he can achieve quite well. Good. Well, well, first I, I want to say something about boys versus girls. Uh, so we've been very, there's an uh, interesting achievement gap in boys versus girls. So in general, uh, in the schools, uh, boys and girls IQ is roughly the same, very small differences. But girls do better in school through year 12 than boys, actually it's a large effect. And it turns out it's an entirely a self-discipline effect. So girls are more disciplined than boys, and we measure this systematically, and once you partial out self-discipline, the male-female difference disappears. So that's part of it, and it's also why it's a particularly important issue for an all-boys school. Now, I, perhaps I have, uh, my scientific standards for having shown that something works really is random assignment placebo controlled studies. So lots of people have proposed ways of increasing self-discipline, but none have ever met my scientific standards. So at this point, I think it's a ripe field in which, uh, to which a lot of attention should be given. And I'd say right now we don't know how to increase self-discipline. Right. Okay. But I guess some <coughs> parental modeling might you know, <laughs> at least assist it. Um, did you say modeling? Yes, yeah, so mod yeah, modeling that, those um, behaviors. So it, I, I, I don't think modeling is the answer. To, I don't know what the answer is to self-discipline, mm. but I've not been impressed by what I've seen in the literature of modeling and self-discipline. Right, okay. Thank you. <coughs> Um, my question is, with your ex experience, have you found any major differences or actually similarities between PERMA in the children in obviously privileged schools like St. Peter's, <coughs> Riverdale in New York, compared to the, you know, the poorest or poorest schools that PERMA you know, occurs at? Um, it's very interesting that uh, emotional stuff, depression, anxiety, and PERMA seem to be, in children, and not a function of class and wealth. So we don't see, it. so if you look at the depression, for example, in children uh, and adolescents, and a lot's been done in America between blacks, whites, and Hispanics. So if anything, white kids have more of it than Hispanic kids who have more of it than black kids. So interestingly, um, unlike the achievement material for which there's quite a lot of class, race, uh, 
uh, research on differences. For their, one doesn't, uh, poor kids are not starting out with a disadvantage on the emotional side of life, as best we can tell. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, you touched on this just in your last answer. I was thinking about um, whether you've worked with populations, indigenous populations and cross-cultural or collective cultures, because I was thinking about how it may apply for Aboriginal people yeah. Yeah, in Australia. Well, uh, we've got some of the leaders of this sitting right behind you. So one of the great questions that one might ask, something like the, even more so than the South Tyneside question in England and the Harlem and North Philadelphia mm -hmm. question, yeah. is there is reason to think that what we've been talking about today is measurable and effective in, with rich populations and poor populations. So one mm. of the really interesting things for me is can these materials and measures be fruitfully applied mm. to the Aboriginal mm. population? No one knows the answer, but I think it's very much worth trying. Mm. Professor Seligman, come back and stand next to me. We're going to thank you. Uh, this is uh, going to bring a close to the second public lecture as part of the Adelaide Thinkers in Residence program. Uh, Professor Seligman, uh, your words, your insights, your wisdom, your guidance on this area of positive psychology as it applies to uh, schools, the area of education, I think uh, gives us the courage to take significant strides into how can we make our schools different. And uh, this is not just about one school, this is about all school children, uh, current and those that uh, come after uh, in the state of South Australia. And uh, we uh, at Saints, we look forward to our partnership with uh, Mount Barker and as we learn together and as we share together that uh, much can be achieved and much can be accomplished but critically much can be shared. Uh, your vision uh, to be a global leader, the state of South Australia, uh, as we flourish and uh, uh, as a lead partner in the residency we know that it's more than education, there's many partners that sit round the thinkers table and uh, it's, uh, to this point, been an exciting two weeks for you and uh, uh, as different parts of this great state gather together to tackle this significant problem but, uh, and this significant issue. But uh, here at Saints and uh, here in South Australia, uh, we certainly have this commitment to uh, uh, apply the learning and the research uh, in the very best of ways to uh, give what every child deserves and that's uh, an education where they can truly be their very best and uh, can flourish in the way that uh, you've described. So thank you this evening and uh, I'd ask uh, school captain Oliver Van Ruth to come forward and uh, Oliver has a presentation to give you as a memento of this lecture here at St Peter's College. So, ladies and gentlemen, this brings the public lecture to a close, but one thing, homework. Uh, lots of hints there to make the remainder of Valentine's Day uh, that rewarding occasion, whether you're starting from a negative or are at zero, or indeed are blessed to be in the positive zone, uh, there's remarkable advice there for the next four hours. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>